As he says, he says, quote, attention to the present moment is in a sense the key to all these spiritual exercises. And he gives as an example, he quotes Marcus Aurelius, who says, everywhere and at, all, and at all times, it is up to you to rejoice piously at what is occurring at the present moment, to conduct yourself with justice toward the people who are present here and now, and to apply rules of discernment to your present circumstances. Hmm. Sounds familiar. It's also very old, and it's also Western. It's Western as well. OK, but then you might ask, if, if all of this was present in those ancient schools, then what happened? And how did philosophy come to be taught as another conceptual discipline along all the other conceptual disciplines? Ado has three answers to this question. He proposes three, three answers. One is, he says, that in philosophy, as in anywhere else in life, there is always a kind of seductive comfort in turning away from suffering and the reality of the moment toward abstraction and conceptualization. And so he says philosophy and philosophers were just as capable of doing that as, as anyone else, as, as any of the rest of us. Second, he argues that Christianity essentially borrowed these spiritual practices, made them their own, and then, in effect, said, and what's left over, that's what we'll call philosophy. So there was a kind of divvying up of the territory uh, between, between, he claims, between Christianity and, um, uh, and, and philosophy. And third, he suggests that medi medieval scholasticism, the movement, the philosophical and religious movement, um, at the time when the first medieval universities were created in the 12th and 13th centuries, um, that this movement of scholasticism, which aimed at systematizing religious dogma and reconciling it with newly discovered works of Aristotle, um, that this became the dominant, this form of argument and conceptualization became the dominant mode in the, in the, in the medieval um, universities. And as a result, he says, clearly with, you, you sense a little bit of energy um, in, when, when he talks about this, in which he says, um, universities were constituted as institutions in which professors trained future professors. Education was thus no longer directed toward people who were to be educated with a view to becoming fully developed human beings, but to specialists in order that they might learn how to train other specialists. So as a result of this, of this gradual diminution and loss of power of the larger vision, the integration of the conceptual with the contemplative and the spiritual, he, he, um, he argues, even the liberal arts, which we take to be that part of the academic domain that still holds to a concern for the whole human being, even that turned more and more to the conceptual and to the text base. And, 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 and had less and less of these, uh, of these qualities of, of direct in investigation of the present. <clears throat> so here, that's the first of the threads that I wanted to tell you about. And I think we are extraordinarily lucky to be doing this work right at this moment because we are in a position, thanks to people like Ado, to begin to understand and argue that the very revered ancient tradition from which we continue to draw so much, at least in word, if not in deed, that it actually, that we can go back to the sources and claim that the integration of, of, of the contemplative into, into today's classroom is actually partially fulfilling and expanding upon that. Not only that, but we are able to recognize this because all of us in this room have been studying and practicing in ways that allow us to begin to have some idea of what Marcus Aurelius and, and, and Plato and Aristotle and all of those people were actually trying to tell us. So we have, we, we, we can argue, we can draw from a deeper well than we realized. So I think we're very lucky and that's, and that's, that's point one. Now, let me turn to industrialization. As you can imagine, it's a very different kind of story <laughs> when we look at um, where we come from and, and, and how industrialization has affected the modern university. Um, 
The modern university basically arises out of industrialization and bureaucratization in the late 19th and early 20th century. And just to remind you, this era, the era, era of industrialization, is a time of large-scale manufacturing <coughs> based on steam-powered heavy machinery, on new faster modes of transportation like the railroad, and new means of communication like the telegraph and the telephone, new methods of working and regulating work, bureaucracy, including a very heavy dose of measurement, um, and overall, a much greater emphasis on speed, production, and efficiency. What I have called to come in my recent writings and speaking, a, a philosophy of more, faster, better. Mm -hmm. Now, it shouldn't be surprising if it was the engineers who crafted the machines, the new machines, and even if they had a very large hand in designing the way factories would work. But what I've learned as I've delved into 19th and 20th century history is that the same men, in very, and they were men, very often were also involved in the design of the new institutions we call corporations, bringing their notions of, uh, of bureaucracy and, even, and their, their mechanistic and machine-like ideas. Indeed, the very idea of a job, a job in a corporation or an organization, is very consciously and directly the translation of the notion of an interchangeable part in a machine put into an organization. So, you know, you can fire somebody and as long as they you get the right kind of person with the right kind of fit, then you can move somebody else in. That was a conscious decision on the part of the engineers. What I didn't realize until I started doing some additional research for the book I'm now writing, which is called um, No Time to Think, what I didn't realize was that the universities themselves were also very much consciously, at least in large measure, designed according to the same engineering philosophies. Um, I used to think that we were, I, I wanted to argue that universities should be leading us out of the, the, these problems, and I still think that we should and, and, and ought to, but I didn't realize that universities were of a piece with the corporations and the factories. In the, early, in the late 19th and early 20th century. They were all part of one larger design. And I want to illustrate this with, with one particular example that you'll probably you know, have some fun with and maybe even hate a little bit too, but it's a, it's a great one. Um, it turns out that 100 years ago, um, a man by the name of Morris Llewellyn Cook, who was an efficiency expert and who was a, a disciple of Frederick Taylor, the famous guy with the stopwatch who is, who is now you know, known for having done so much to, to create the efficient fa factory and so on. Uh, Morris Llewellyn Cook was asked by the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching, which still exists today and was in its infancy. In 1910, he was asked to look at the state of the colleges and universities and to see if he could bring the spirit and the, and the wisdom of these new forms of bureaucracy and efficiency to, to the universities. And he wrote a report published in 1910 called Academic and Industrial Efficiency. Um, and in this, what he essentially did was, and, and Arthur, you'll appreciate this, he focused in particular on physics departments in eight American and Canadian universities, including Harvard, MIT, and the University of Toronto. His intention was to show how techniques for measurement, standardization, and accountability that had been developed for efficient production within factories and other commercial establishments could be applied, and indeed should be applied, in institutions of higher education. In a section entitled, listen to this, in a section entitled, The College Teacher as Producer, <laughs> he declares that, quote, until efficiency is used as the sole standard, I, I want you to hear this. Until efficiency is used as the sole standard for the teaching profession, 